On a typical Sunday morning, we would begin with something of a well, and I would pause a second, but I don't think today turns is one of those days we ought to do that. I think our emotions today are at a different place, and we need to pause, and we need to pray. We need to understand a little bit about why we're here today, and ultimately deal with the emotions that we all are. We're all, none of us today, were planning to be here at this place, and for some of you who may be sort of wondering what's going on because you've, uh, maybe you're new here today. Uh, our worship pastor uh, left this past week and uh, we are in a place that we're sort of all reeling with trying to figure out what's going on and uh, trying to figure it out. We did meet with the worship team last night trying to make some sense of the matter, trying to maybe try to find a way that we could bring some sense of readiness for today. Uh, to deal with the emotions, and we all are are grieving, we're struggling on many different levels and for different reasons. But uh, as we met last night, as it do, as it happens with every meeting, there's there were many of those who came last night who had no understanding of really what's going on, or really no, they were just trying to look for information. There were others that came last night with um, maybe with just brokenness, and that's understandable. We. To many, many level, all of us are brokenness, and there were even others that came last night with a set of preconceived notions that, um, uh, that you know, they, I guess they understood what was going on. But um, at the end of our meeting last night, what I, what I came away with is we were trying to find a way with the group to sort of say, hey, listen, where do we go from here? What do we do? How do we, how do we move forward? We had a lot of ideas. You put... As we've oftentimes said, you put a bunch of Baptists together and you'll get a lot of ideas. And so we had a lot of ideas. Um, the problem is last night as we gathered and uh, as we sort of ended our meeting, um, I, I just don't think it ended very well, uh, to be honest with you. I, I know for me it did not. I found myself leaving last night and I, I literally walked home to my wife and I said, I'm done. I will not go back. And uh, my wife did exactly what she always has done, um, and uh, I probably did what I most of the time have done. I sort of crawled up and took some medicine, went to bed, and went to sleep. My wife stood up all night and prayed. And this morning, I found myself at a different place. The neat thing about it is that's the way God works, is it not? And I felt like that God said to me this morning as I arose early, I was up before four, and I felt that God say to me, the problem is, is you're looking for answers from human beings. Answers will never be found in humanity. You'll find it only in me. And I did what I oftentimes will do. I find, I go and opened the word and I read for a while this morning and then I read a guy by the name of John Piper. Anybody ever heard of John Piper? John Piper uh, is a tremendous scholar of today, a theologian, a pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church up in, up in the north and, and I picked up and read from him. I oftentimes do. He's challenging to my spirit and I wanted this morning to share with you because it was convicting to me and yet I believe also for me, it set the stage of where we need to be as we move forward. Here's his word. Seeking the Lord means to seek his presence. Presence is a common translation in the Hebrew, uh, for the Hebrew word face. Literally, we are to seek his face. But this is the Hebraic way of having access to God. To be before his face is to be in his presence. But aren't his children always in his presence, he asked? Yes and no. Yes in two senses, he said. First, in the sense that God is omnipotent and therefore always near to everything and everyone. He holds everything in his being, his power is everlasting and sustaining and governing all things. And second, yes, he's always present with his children in the sense that he has covenant commitment to always stand by us. He sticks closer to us than what a brother but there's also a sense, he went, goes on to write, in which God's presence is not always with us. For this reason, the Bible report repeatedly calls you and I to seek the Lord, to seek his presence continually, Psalm 105, verse 4. 
God's manifest conscience, trusted presence is not our constant experience, but it should be our constant pursuit. His face, his brightness, his character is often hidden behind the curtain of our carnal fleshly desires, oftentimes veiled in behind the circumstances where we find ourselves. This condition is always ready to overtake us, and that's why we're called to continually seek his presence. God calls us to enjoy continual consciousness of his supreme greatness, his beauty, and his worth. And it's to that end that I think I would invite us this morning that we ensure ourselves one more time that we seek his presence. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, we thank you today for the privilege that you have given to us as your children to be able to come to your throne of grace and to be able to acknowledge in the midst of all that's taking place, acknowledge honestly that we, many of us, don't understand. And that's okay. It's not okay that we don't understand because we really want to understand, but it's okay that even though we don't understand, we do know this much, that you are indeed Lord, our Savior, and you are indeed in control of all things. Hence, today, we know nothing more than to find a way to lean into the promise of your presence, and ultimately, we today seek your face. And so, God, today, I pray that you'd help us as a body of Christ to be able to set aside that which we all struggle with, and we're all struggling to some level. And help us, Father, that we might seek your face. I pray for my brother James. I pray for his wife, Emily, for their children. Would you manifest your presence in their life? Would you give clarity of mind and heart to them as well? And all we know nothing more today to simply say thank you because even in our confusion, we know you're at work and we trust you. And we bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's where we've been today, and Karen, I'm sorry I swapped Bibles with you on the way up this morning, but that's okay. You've got, you got, you got notes this morning. I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. I, I can read out this Bible the same. Anyway, we, uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, we want to find a way to uh, open up God's Word, but I feel like it would be helpful for us as to sort of turn the tide of our, our emotions this morning. I think there's something about the lightheartedness of, of uh, somehow that sort of sets a healing. You know, the Bible says that laughter is a good medicine. So I'm going to borrow a story from Chuck Swindoll. Some of you all may have heard that name. Been a preacher for many days. And he writes in his book, Laugh Again. And he says this is his favorite story that he smiles every time he recalls it. He tells of a story of a grandmother and a granddaughter, a very precocious 10-year-old, he said, who were spending the evening together when the little girl suddenly, suddenly looked up at her grandmother and said, Grandma, how old are you? The woman was a bit scattered or startled at the question, but knowing her granddaughter's quick little mind, she wasn't completely shocked, and she said, Honey, when you're my age, you don't share your age with anybody. Ah, the little girl said, Grandma, you can trust me. Grandma said, No, dear. I'll never tell anybody my age. Well, the grandmother went on about the evening, thought the conversation was over, and she went about fixing dinner that evening to try to sort of get finish up the journey that she was at, uh, working on anyway. And she went, about 20 minutes had transpired, and she recognized the little granddaughter had been away for a while. And so she looked up and tried to figure out where she was at and she stepped up into up the steps into her bedroom and looked and in the middle of the floor was grandma's pocketbook dumped out on the floor and the little girl was sitting in the middle of her pocketbook. And she looked and the little girl had grandma's driver's license in her hand. And she said, grandma, you're 76 years old. The lady says, yes, I am. How do you know that? The little girl said, I found your date on your driver's license and subtracted that from this year, and I found out that you're 76 years old. She said, that's right, sweetheart. Your grandmother's 76. The little girl continued to stare at the driver's license, and she added this comment. 
Grandma, did you know you also made an F in sex? <laughs> anyway, maybe we can find a way to transition this morning into something more wholesome. First Timothy chapter three, we've been talking about for the last several weeks on leadership, and we've been in a series focusing upon God's call of humanity, all of us to be leaders, and in our call to be leaders, he's called us as leaders to be able to display and reflect the person, the character of our Heavenly Father. You know, the scripture reminds us that as the church, you and I have been, have been entrusted with the responsibility to be, according to what he would say in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, the pillar and foundation of truth. And he would go on out of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and tell us that the foundation of that truth is, is found in the embodiment of a person, and that person's name is Jesus. Chapter 4 of 1 Timothy would remind us that he said that the reason why I even go to that level, why I want to point out to you is because he would say, in the last days, there's going to be some that's going to turn away from truth. They'll follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. And these people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are seared or dead. And Paul would even take that same concept and carry it over into the second book of Timothy. You remember that Paul was writing to young Timothy. He was writing to young Timothy as Paul, as Timothy was challenged to go into the church at Ephesus to begin to address the matters that had begun to go awry in the church. And as a result of that, young Timothy was given the challenge to rise up to not only be their leader, but also to demonstrate to them what leaders look like. And he would write his second Timothy, sort of a follow-up to his first letter, and he would remind him again that there's going to be, in those last days, those that would turn away. Verse 2 Timothy 3 says this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving and they will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed with pride and, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the very power that would otherwise make them godly. And his comment to young Timothy was, stay away from people like that. They're the kind of people who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of, of vulnerable people who are burdened with guilt and sin and controlled by various desires. He would continue on in verse 10 of that passage, but you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live. You've had the opportunity to examine my life and to look at my life and to see the, the display of faith in my life and my, what my purpose in life is. He said, young Timothy, you know my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. You've seen how, how much persecution and suffering I have endured and you know about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra and the Lord has rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You know, Paul would explain back in 1 Timothy, in verse, verse 6, and he would say to us, 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, he would remind us back, he says, if you'll take and explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will do what God's called you to do. The one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching that you have followed don't waste your time arguing over the godless ideas and old wives' tales, but rather your responsibility is to train yourself, and we talked about this at length last week, to be godly. It's amazing when the Apostle Paul writes the letter to First and Second Timothy, his heart is seeking to be able to impart within Timothy that that would ultimately make him to be the leader that ultimately... Ephesus, the church at Ephesus needed to be. And ultimately, as Paul would encourage Timothy to rise up to be that leader, that Timothy would also impart these same ideas and ideologies into those who would follow after him so that the church and its leadership would continue on in the years and years and ultimately decades and centuries and millennium to come. So we look at the word of God. 
to be able to find out what it means for us to understand Christian leadership and how it is that we should develop Christian leadership. And that's really the topic for our time together this morning as we look at this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3. What we, what we do know and what we understand in most of our cultural settings today is we talk about leadership development, but more often than not, when we talk about leadership development, we're talking about one of two things. We're either talking about, number one, what's essential knowledge. In other words, what is it that you need to know in order to be the leader that God's called you to be? It has probably everything to do or most things to do regarding the educational process. I, I, I'm a big advocate of education. I, I've spent 17 years after high school going to school. It took me a long time to finish. The reality is we need to prepare ourselves, but is that what's going to make a person a good, godly leader? Can we know enough to ever be able to rise to the place that ultimately we become godly? Is that ultimately what's going to train us to become the, care, the, the godly leader that God has ultimately challenged us and inviting us to be? We've all been called to be leaders. We've talked about that. God has called us to that place because we're all people of influence. We have people around us who are, we're influencing. And whether we are actually utilizing some method of teaching or not, we're teaching people by the way we choose to live our lives. And so when we, we look at our modern idea of leadership development, we talk about it many times from, from, from the perspective of the essential knowledge that we have. Or secondly, we look at it from the instruction that in the know-how or the how-tos of, of things. I, I brought Miss Roxy's now part of our church staff and, and I'm excited about the opportunity, but she, she keeps talking about these things called SOPs. And from a guy who didn't grow up in the military... I really didn't know what, whether she was having some you know, words that we probably shouldn't say in church or not. And then I asked her one day, I says, what is an SOP? And she said, it's a standard. See, you knew that. I didn't. The reality is in life is so oftentimes we take and develop leadership prospectively in our culture today by either helping them to know what's necessary to know or to teach them how, how to do a particular task through standard operating procedures. But when we go back to the Bible... When we understand what God has to say regarding leadership development, when we go back to Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy in particular, he doesn't talk to him at all about what's necessary to know. He doesn't talk about what's necessary to do. He talks about one of two things, and these two are inseparable, but yes, they're, yet they're different. He talks about, first of all, character. He talks about the aspect of character. The character development that God has called us to, the mental and moral qualities that distinguish an individual. From a biblical standpoint, character is defined as the strength or the moral fiber of an individual. A.W. Tozer writes, he says, it's described as the excellence of moral beings. He would go on to define that as, as the excellence of gold in it is its purity and the excellence of art is in its beauty, so the excellence of a man is in his character. Persons of character are noted for their honesty, for their ethics, for their charity. Uh, descriptions such as a man of principle or a woman of integrity are oftentimes assertions of that kind of character. And the lack of character is moral deficiency. Persons lacking character who tend to behave dishonestly, unethically, and, un and uncharitably. Character is part of, the, part of the matters that Paul addresses in the book of 1 Timothy as he, as he talks to the, the person of Timothy and as he talks about the, the, the characteristics that we ought to be able to pursue and look for as we look for those who lead us. The second thing has to do with virtues. Not just characters, but virtues. And again, these two things are inseparable, there are, but there are some distinguished. The, the issue of virtue has to do with the moral excellence, the e essence of which self-sacrifice, which is also the essence of, a, of good works and a good work ethic. While virtuous behavior does not guarantee purity and innocent, it ultimately shows itself in the attitudes that drives a successful, righteous Christian walk. The two of these pieces are intertwined 
And remember what, what Paul said, it's sort of the key verse that we've talked about, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. If I'm delayed, you simply need to know, let people know how they must conduct themselves in the household of, household of God, the church body, because this church is the living God, which is the, as we've said many times, the pillar and foundation of truth. Glenn Miller, Miller says regarding leadership development, it's called, oftentimes in, in this modern world in a tug of war between knowledge and know-how, and yet character and virtues are often the missing link of what it really means to be a leader in today's culture. So as I think about leadership today and as I bring, and this series comes to the next, next logical step, we today talk about that leader and we talk about it from the perspective of 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. Would you follow along with me? And uh, I'm, since I've traded Bibles, I'm going to be reading from the NIV today. So sorry about that. Here's, here's, here's the reading from the NIV. Here's a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but a love, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family wells and see that his children obey him with, power, with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert. Or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into in the devil's trap. Let me, if I can this morning, take an opportunity to give a brief outline to that text. And then hopefully at the end of that, ask the question, what does that mean for us? The reality is when we open God's word, we need to be looking. While we oftentimes may read a passage like this and we say, that has no application to me. We may look at the Old Testament and read something about the Old Testament priest and say, that has nothing to do with me, but all of God's word has something to do with us. And we need to be asking God every time we open God, how do I need to apply that to my life? What do I need to learn? What is it that I need to grow from? And so after this outline, we'll be trying to address that. So this passage talks to us about the character issues regarding the Christian leader, namely here being the overseer of the church, but I think applicable to every one of us. It has, first of all, to do with personal integrity. Verses 2 and verse 7 both have to do with that personal integrity. Verse 2 reminds us that the overseer is to be above reproach. Verse 7, he also must have a good reputation above reproach to those who he walks among, above a good reputation from those he walks around. So from the inside as well as the outside, those who would look at and respect and recognize him. And scripture simply says that that's the way we must look for that, that leader among us, someone who has a good reputation. It's not just about 1 Timothy 3, someone who has a desire to be a leader, but someone who actually has earned the right through his character to lead. Barnes says it this way, he must be a man of good private character, possessing and illustrating the Christian virtues, or as we would say now, an upright man and a Christian gentleman. I've oftentimes utilized passages in scripture, as I've looked back in my own life and found those seasons in my life, maybe similar to where we are today, and find that, uh, you know, fingers are pointing at you. You ever had those opportunities in life? You know, pa God gave me a verse many, many years ago in 1 Peter chapter 3. It's a verse that I've committed to memory, sort of more of a paraphrase than I do out of scripture. But let me read that verse to you today out of the context of it. He said this, keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life that you live because you belong to Christ. In other words, live in such a way that when people speak all manner of evil against you, they will be put to shame because of the character of your life. The reality is Paul writes to Timothy and says in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, and he reminds me, he says, you, look at my life, examine it, you've seen it. 
Now understand in the midst of it all, you've had an opportunity to be able to see that life lived out. You've seen the integrity of life, the honesty and the adherence to a pattern of good works. You've been able to observe that. You've seen that I've not been able to be bribed or coerced in order to do something for someone. I've not compromised my moral principles. You've been able to see that. Therefore, it's the characteristic of leadership of personal integrity. Secondly, it has to do with moral fidelity. Moral fidelity. The husband of one wife, verse, t- verse 2 says. The reality is, what is it that he's talking about here? Most of us grew up in traditional churches. Most of us, because of our traditional churches, we had a set of traditional value systems that were in the church. And sometimes those value systems doesn't always line up with exactly what God's word has to say. But when you read this passage of scripture, the husband of one wife, what is it indeed saying? What is his intention to this passage? Well, the reality is you can look back at history and you can look back at the culture of the time. You can look back at the Roman Empire and what's taking place in the Roman Empire and you can understand that polygamy was a, was a, was a common practice among the day, people of that day. It was common for men to have many, many ladies as it, uh, for wives. We saw that in even, in even some of the kings of the Old Testament. And maybe to have those on the outside of of a relationship. But polygamy was a reality in that day. So could he be speaking regarding that's possible? Could he be speaking also about any type of remarriage? Maybe a person, a, a gentleman whose wife passed away and he remarried as a result of his wife. Or maybe a, a person who actually was divorced from his wife and he was now remarried, and which is where we find ourselves most of the time in our culture sort of giving definition to. Which is that? Is that what he says? The neat thing about it is scripture is also very clear and, and the Greek language is also very specific and Paul uses the word divorce on many other occasions and if he intended it to be divorce, why didn't he use, this, use divorce in this passage here? So what does he mean? I think most commentators have sort of fall, come to the place of this, that the general character trait that he's asking about here is the one who is devoted to his one wife. The main issue is how he treats his wife and how devoted he is to her. Towner points out this way that the point of the phrase is probably not how often one can be remarried, not precisely what constitutes a legitimate marriage, but rather how one conducts himself in the marriage that he has today. It's also not only moral fidelity, but also it has to do with this issue of emotional maturity, how it is in life that we have matured and grown and character oftentimes is is developed in those hard seasons of life where we find ourselves not wanting to be like we are today where we where 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 we find ourselves having to sort of rise up to do something that maybe we would rather not be doing today but the reality is God's called us to that task and we do that not because we are human we do that because God has called us beyond our humanness Galatians chapter 5 would remind us in the midst of our emotional struggles at times, but the Holy Spirit produces within every one of us who walk with him. The Spirit's fruit in our life is love, right? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. It's not because we're naturally that. No, it's because the Spirit of God births that and brings fruit of that into our life. And how does that see, how does that prove out in our life? How do we see that? How do we observe that? And in this context, he talks about several aspects of that. First of all, how we see the maturity in one's life as we see that relationship to Christ as, or their relationship to Christ. Verse six says they're not to be a recent convert. Why? Because he might become proud and the devil would then cause him to fall. In other words, not a novice, not somebody that's brand new. We don't want new converts in that regard. They'll get burned, burned out, quit. Sometimes even those who are seasoned find themselves at times tempted to do the same. Reality is our relationship with Christ is that which forms within us and shapes within us a character that causes us in our relationship with Christ to to act out differently than we would in a natural kind of way. There's also this emotional maturity, not only in our relationship with Christ, but in our reaction to difficult circumstances like we find ourselves in today. Sometimes that happens in the life of a church. 
It's a discussion in our world that we continue to deal with. And sometimes we just find ourselves in places that we'd rather not be in difficult circumstances. The pressure's on and challenges are at us. What do we do? How, how do we deal with that? Verse 2 gives us two words. The, the, the leader is to be temperate and he's also to be respectable. Temperate has to do with his attitude, has to, having to do with the calmness of his attitude. Respectable has to do with his behavior, a controlled behavior, not reacting to the actions around them. And then he gives to us sort of another category of people, and I've given a list here of five of those, sort of all starting with C, that has to do with our, our response to other people. You've probably had those people in your life. I know I've had those people in my life that know exactly how to push a button in your life. And sometimes, maybe that's their spiritual gift. <laughs> but how we respond to those people is determined by the character that's already developed within. And that's where the leadership development piece comes from. He says in verse 2, we're to be sober-minded. The word sober-minded really means to be contented. It has to do with a sense of confidence in the, in the person that we are because of who Christ has made us to be. Our confidence is not in, not in our accomplishments. Our confidence is not in anything else. It's real, it's confidence is solely related into our identity in Christ Jesus. We have a lot of folks around us and we, we deal with that at times and all of us to some level have levels of insecurity in our life but those, at that levels of insecurity has to be found a, a sense of satisfaction and sufficiency in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where character lies. Sober-minded. Verse 2 also gives to us another word of hospitable. The word hospitable, we, we'll use the word concerned. The ability hospitable here to love strangers. That doesn't mean to, that you'll stand on the corner waiting for people to come by, but he's the one that likes to meet people. If you want to know what a hospitable person looks like, all you need to go back and look at Jim Norman. Most of you this morning, if you come to our church new, you, he's one of the, perf if he's not the first, he's one of the first people you'll meet because he loves to meet people. And he loves to encourage them. He is, a, he is the epitome of what it means to be hospitable. The third characteristic that we find here, the, his ability to teach, to be able to teach. I'll use the word confident here. It's not necessarily to say that someone's ready to get up and preach a sermon. That's not necessarily the context here. But it, but it is a sense of confidence in the fact that we know whose we are. We know what we are and we know what the truth is and we're not ashamed or afraid to be able to communicate that to the people around us. There's a sense of confidence, the ability to teach, to influence people's lives, to be able to help them to be able to see Christ living in us, to model for them what real, real Christian faith looks like. And that's what God has called us as leaders to be. Verse 3 gives to us another word. It's the word gentle. We'll use the word considerate here. It's a beautiful picture of someone who can listen to someone else's opinion and remain considerate and to remain gentle and listen even though opinions may not be the same. Sometimes we have a hard time. I don't know if you've ever had those opportunities in life where you've you felt like you needed to interject and sometimes, you know, we've, you've heard it said sometimes God gave us two ears and one mouth and we ought to listen twice, twice as much as we speak. Sometimes it's hard to listen, right? But how, how critical it is for you just to simply pause and be gentle and listen. Because sometimes we can learn a lot in our process of listening. Verse 3 gives to us another word, not violent. Or here's the word careful, I think probably spells that out for us. The ability not to lash out. Don't lose your temper or harbor anger against people who may, may otherwise speak evil or ill against you. Sometimes it's so easy for us to, you know, the old cliche is do unto people before they have an opportunity to do to you. You know, that's not what God's called us to do as his, as his children. We're to be kind and considerate one to another. We're to be not violent. We're to rather to listen and, and care for and to be able to demonstrate love and concern to even who people who may despise us. 
verse 3 wraps up this list with a word not quarrelsome that has to do with the word cautious. Matter, matter of fact, one translation translates it uncontentious. Arguments are condemned over and over and over in Proverbs. And how many times in relationships have we got into a position where that we were more concerned about being right than we were about the relationship's health? Not quarrelsome, not argumentative, protecting the relationship over and above the ability for us to be right. I'll give you one more. We could say more about this passage, but verses 4 and 5 has to do with spiritual authority, I think. And he talks about spiritual authority from the perspective of, 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 of the leader's ability to be able to be the leader in his, his, or her, his own home. And if, he, if he's not able to lead his own home, how can he be a leader in the church of God? That not, only, that, that, not, that not only speaks about the perspective of leading out in the family, but also submitting to the authorities that are around us. You know, so many times in life, we, we want to be able to say, I'm in charge, but how much are you really in charge of? Not much. God's in charge, right? The rest of us learn how to submit underneath the authority of the Almighty and underneath the authorities that God has placed in us. Parents, need to, uh, parents learn to be submissive to their parents. And if they ne- didn't learn to be submissive to their parents, how can they learn to parent their own children? It carries on in, in life, the in issues and the matters about authority and understanding the proper way for us to respond and to live under authority and also to display and express authority in the lives that we live. So the question that I have here as I have in every time when I open up God's word is, so what? What does it mean for me? Obviously, this has something to do with me because I'm the overseer of the church in that regard. I understand that. But what does it have to do with us? What does it have to do with the, the, the Mr. and Mrs. Smith in our church that, I hope we don't have a Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I'm not calling anyone out. But anyway, uh, what does it have to do with them that may find themselves not in a position of, of, of church leadership? Maybe they're still trying to figure this thing out. Maybe they're probably even on the bubble about whether they really are willing to follow after Christ or not. What does it have to do with them? I think there's two things, and I want to make sure today that we try to make application of that. Number one is this. Leaders can leave, excuse me, leaders can lead without having well-developed Christian character or virtues. We see it way too often, do we not? Folks who come into positions of leadership find positional leaders who find themselves in a place where they've been called to leave and somewhere along the line they leave character out the door. Their virtues are gone. The reality is we need men and women who actually will rise to the occasion and be godly as they're trying to help to others to be godly. Yet having tremendous skills and understanding will never replace the essential nature in your life and my life of spiritual development. God has called us to be developed spiritually. We are to nurture. We are called to to grow up. We're called to develop a life of godliness. Secondly, and I've asked this question every time, how will you spend the rest of your life? How will you spend the rest of your life? We don't really know what time that has for us. I don't know what time it has for me. But how am I going to spend the rest of my life? Will I determine to never cease being a learner? I can promise you that I'm going to keep learning. My dad was my motivation, my driving force behind that. 58 when I was born, he, he, he passed away at 81 years of age. And uh, I, I saw him all of his days being a continual learner. He only went to the fourth grade in school. Born in 1904. In those days, his, his dad died when he was in the fourth grade, and he, he, he and his older brother went home to take care of the farm. That's what, that's what kids did in those days. But he was one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. He was a mathematician. He knew math. He was determined to grow. But will you submit? Will I submit to God's development process? 
Will I submit, and we used to use these terms around here a lot, but I've, I've chosen not to use it anymore. Will we submit to those character-building opportunities? <laughs> because it's God's time, God's purpose in those weighty times of life to develop two things, your character and the virtues that will come forth from a well-developed godly character. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you today and we thank you so much for the privilege that we have as your children to be able to call you Father and to recognize that in the midst of life we have oftentimes been placed into positions that we would rather not be. And honestly enough, sometimes we're like the pastor that we're ready to walk, to bail, to run, because it's easier outside of it than it is inside of it. But I'm grateful, God, that we have people around us to encourage us, and we have a Heavenly Father that will not leave us alone. You pursue a relationship with us, and you will not let us go. And it's amazing how that in the midst of one season what's going to bed and in another season waking up and how that the Spirit of God through the process totally transforms the way we see life. So God, today I pray for all of us that in the midst of our opportunity to grow that you would do your best work in us and that we would be submissive to that work being done and to that end, we'll thank you and praise you because you alone know who we need to be and you alone know what it's going to take to get us there. May we be willing to receive from your hand that which you give to us. We pray in Jesus' name.